I remember showing blue, red, yellow, green to people like A&Rs and stuff. And they were like, oh, this is not like, this is not where you should go. Like you shouldn't be doing this. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, have you ever heard of hunger, hunter Gex? Like they're doing crazy shit. Like I want to try shit like that. Like I want to do the snare. Like I want to, <laughs> I want to, I want to do shit like that. First off, uh, I feel like the prospect of remixing a single song is like ambitious enough, uh, let alone a full album. So I'm wondering like how and when did the idea of like reassembling the entirety of Spark come to you? It was when Grimes did it. Grimes did it with her album. I forget. I don't even know the name of the album. I only know a few songs off the album. On like my release radar or something one time, I saw an entire remix album with everybody doing different remixes. And I was like, I have a lot of friends that make fire music. So it'd be, like so cool if I could like pull that off and so as the album was getting closer and i had more and more songs done i started asking people around seeing like yo would you be interested in this would you be interested in this and then once the album was done uh i just reached out and sent everybody stems and it was difficult but got it done yeah shit. it's interesting that you mentioned that like it was something that you were formulating like as the original album was being made that that's super duper interesting and then on the remix there are a few a fair few tracks that uh you contributed new vocals to like on the 13 remix uh but i'm wondering like you mentioned that you just sent stems out to people i'm wondering did you play like an integral role in the creation of all the remixes or was it more so just like hey here are the stems like just go run wild with it well some of them have like multiple people working together like for example the photophobia one uh, like Kaizen and underscores like didn't know each other and so I was like the the person that bridged the gap because I remember I sent Kaizen the song originally and I was like it'd be really cool if you jumped on this somehow for the remix he's like yeah and so when uh, I sent it to Devin and Devin sent it back with like the crazy dove stuff I was like yo Kaizen you still down for this so I like connected people mostly uh, but other than the ones that the 13 remix I did like some production on and I did I wrote like those two verses and like helped like plan the layout with Bryce and stuff like that I just I was pretty hands off I just gave gave to people and I knew that like I'm fans of all the people I gave it to uh, along with being friends with them and I was like I know that you guys are going to kill it. And they all came back super good. And I was like, this is crazy. On the topic of 13, I understand you wrote the piano melody for 13, like what, like three years before the original song was created. So I'm wondering, like, have there ever been any like instances where you've used like a melody or maybe lyrics that you wrote like way before like that? Yeah, um, a lot. I wrote the, the 13 piano melody, I think in like 2018 or something like that. And I was just, that was back when I was still in school. I would go to like the school's like piano rooms after classes and just like dink around. <laughs> and I wrote that and I recorded it on a voice memo. And then as the album was finishing up, like three weeks before I had to submit it, I was like, I hate the number 12. I don't <laughs> want it to be 12 tracks. I was like, that. That's like the last thing I need is for it to be 12 tracks. I'm a big fan of underscores and their whole branding where they have all the little like random short vocal chops that they can then throw in all through through all their projects. It's the new wave of the future. Yeah. 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 All that. It creates like such a world. And so like you hear those things and you're like, oh, let's go. It's an underscore song. So I was like, I don't have much of those, but I think that like if I got like all my friends to like contribute to this this one track the album is just about like being with your friends that's like what wake up is like it's a tribute to your friends and your fans and like not worrying about like the relationship or anything like that and so i was like yeah let's just make a track and i need an instrumental for the background and so i went scrolling through my voice memos and i went like all the way back and i was like i remember this one piano thing that i used a long time ago and i just put it in the back and it, and it worked and it was the original recording from 2018 but it was kind of shitty and it wasn't even a voice memo it was a snapchat memory <laughs> and so like every 10 seconds there was like a chop in the yeah, audio it was like, a, like drop off yeah yeah because you can down when you download like a snapchat memory it like does it in 10 second increments so i was trying to get it to work out but every 10 seconds would be like a weird thing so then i went to my friend elroy's house uh and he has a piano so I recorded the piano again on his like real grand piano. To your question, which was like hibiscus, I did that. I remember I had the guitar and I wrote like a melody, just like a humming melody on top, which was like the main melody, the dun 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 dun, 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 dun whatever. And like nine months later, I was just going through my files and like clicked on it and was like, whoa this is like fire why didn't i ever write more to it and then that day just made like the whole song i think i do that a lot i'll, I'll definitely like start something 
and then not really know what to do with it, save it, and then anywhere from five months to like a year or even two years, like come back to it, be like, oh, it's good, or like realize that there's a part in it that I need for something that I'm making now, find like a, the one stem that I think is like really cool and just try to build a new song around that. That's super interesting. Or like imagining like what you're recording right now that you'll come back to in a year or two and be like, oh, like, oh, this is worth the revisiting. And also like it's, that's crazy that you mentioned like the the inspiration for like the um this is gonna be the first summer of our lives um coming from underscores because that's like the exact vibe that i got from it like i was like yeah. oh this reminds me a ton of all the stuff sprinkled throughout fishmonger how do you land on the phrase uh this is gonna be the first summer of our lives um oh fuck what was it i think i re so a lot of times like shit will just come to me whether i'm like driving around or i'm at a party or i'm like wait i wake up and i had it in a dream and it's just like random like phrases or like things that'll eventually be worked into lyrics or stuff like that. And I think that it was springtime or something. Like all the people that say this is gonna be the first time our lives, a lot of them are on the remix album, are the artists that like remixed songs. And those people I had all just become friends with that winter. And I was like, last summer was COVID summer. It sucked. 2019, I didn't know. I was just starting like to gain traction with music and like I didn't have this crazy friend group that I have now. This is like gearing up to be like a crazy summer and it feels like I haven't had a great summer in forever. And like, I'm a much different person now than who I was in 2019. So I was like, in theory, it's gonna be my first summer. And I was like, I'm gonna make sure this is everyone's first summer. So then I just got them all to say it. I don't think there was any, there wasn't anything specific. It was just an idea that I had randomly at some point and threw in my notes. And then on the 13 remix, uh, you mentioned that despite living in Philly, you go up to New York City pretty often. Uh, so I'm wondering like, what would you say are some of the craziest or like weirdest things you've seen driving up and down uh, on the East Coast? I don't know. There, I mean, it's just, it's like a two hour drive. And I do it so often now. Uh, it's almost like I, I, I feel like I go almost every weekend. I think I've spent equal amount of days in New York and in Philly since the beginning of the new year. And I think the last like three or four months of 2021, I spent more time in New York than in Philly. Wow. And I just I just sleep on people's couches. And, and so the drive now, I almost don't even realize it happens. You know, like I get in the car, I, it, I'm like, I'm driving, I'm aware while I'm getting to the highway. And then once I'm on the New Jersey Turnpike, you know, you just, I'm just like zoned out. It was like very late at night, I was making the Spark CDs that I was gonna sell out a show. And it was like 1 a.m., 2 a.m. And I was supposed to go visit my friend Ale. And I was like, yo, I'll come up at night when I'm done with the CDs. And I thought I'd be done with the CDs at like 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. And I was working on them till like 1.30 in the morning. And so I finished them all, threw them in a bag. And I was like, yo, Ale, could I still come up? So I left my house at like 2 in the morning. But right when I was almost into like the city of New York, I got a speeding ticket. So then I was stuck with a cop for like 45 minutes. And it was like a $500 speeding ticket. Jesus, and really? it was so horrible. And I got to his house at 4 a.m. So that sucks. So like the only thing I could say is like, don't speed once you get close to New York. Everywhere else though, you're all, you're good to go. <laughs> yeah, like the New Jersey Turnpike, I'm pretty sure you're good to go everywhere. And usually there's enough cars to where like, if everybody's speeding, everybody's speeding, you know? <laughs> right, yeah. But like- Yeah, they can't catch us all, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was no other cars on the road and I was about to cross the Verrazano Bridge and I saw the cop and tried to slow down and it was too late. And then uh, were there any tracks uh, you got back from like everybody once they sent the songs back to you that you were particularly like surprised to hear the direction they took? I can imagine like hearing the dubstep stuff on like uh, on Photophobia was kind of a crazy like first reaction yeah but i knew so i sent it to devin and me and devin are good friends and i was like you know devin is one of the greatest producers i know mm -hmm. so i gave them kind of first choice on any of the songs i was like if you want to do any of these you can do any of them and then was like i want to do photophobia and can i do dubstep and i was like <laughs> of course you can i'm not going to tell you no and that'd be fire so when i got it back i wasn't like surprised that it was dubstep and obviously it was freaking crazy so i was like so excited for that but i think uh the postcard boy one was really surprising because i reached out to garrett garrett and i have been wanting to work on together work together on something for like three years and i was like you, would you want to do this and he was like i've never done a remix of anything before hmm. and so i was like look just take the stems you could literally just add a verse 
or you could just like change the production or like do anything just make something any part of it different uh and then the song is in three four and he switched it to four four and had like a really soft nice like beautiful groove to it and it was that that first part especially really blew me away because it was one of the first remixes i got back to and so that one when i heard that one i was like oh my god like this this could be something crazy. Like it was like a mark of like, oh shit, what's everybody else's are gonna sound like? I don't know. I I kind of expected a lot of people to be like, ah, whatever. It's just for like someone else. Like I'll add a verse and just like move on. But then everybody like super exceeded my expectations. And also the is this really how it ends one with Jace? That was like the second one I got back, and I was like, oh my god, like you completely flipped it and made it upbeat when before. It was yeah, like, that's like the thing that like that struck me about it. It's like this really like somber, like slow, like piano, and then like it's flipped into like a, like an upbeat song. Yeah, yeah, it's like a pop song, and it was so sick. Those two were definitely the most surprising, especially also in the sense that like I had no idea what was coming. So then when it, I got all the other ones back, and they're also crazy and crazy different, I was more prepared for like something crazy and then uh, on the topic of photophobia uh, you recently mentioned on twitter that photophobia is your personal favorite song you've ever created uh so i'm wondering were there any tracks on the remix album that you consider like better than the originals or do you all just consider them just like as good but just different i always want to be like the they're all great everything's great thing but then I'm, I'm also one of those people that always has an obsession on ranking things. My friend Pat always talks to me about it and he's like, why do we have to put them up against each other? Like, it doesn't matter. Like, I have like my top like 30 songs of all time ranked in order. I have, I always have my favorite songs of the year in a playlist and I always rank like the top 10 or whatever. I don't know. It's just, it's just fun for me to sit there and think about what makes something different. But in this, in that scenario where all, it's all songs that I made versus songs that other people made, it's hard for me to like compare my music to like just music by anyone else. And all the, all the remix songs, like, yeah, they contain elements of mine, but a lot of them are just completely new songs. Like the Phantom one is just a whole new song. It like, it, it barely holds any of the characteristics of the original one. The 13 one obviously is like a full song out of like a 40 second like interlude kind of thing so i don't know if i can say any are better or worse because because as an artist it's all you'll always hold a special place in your heart for like the songs that you make in the same way that like when i make a demo like i'll listen to it over and over and over and over again and just obsess with it and like even though it's like me and like a lot of people could see that as being like obsessed with yourself it's more of just it's like writing in a journal it's like speaking to yourself it's like going over your own thoughts it's just it just happens to be like a soundtrack i'll say that a lot of the remixes i've been djing a lot and a lot of the remixes are way better in dj sets than like my original ones a lot of them are hit a lot harder i don't i don't feel as if i have i'm one to have like really crazy hard hitting drums and there are a lot of crazy hard hitting drums on the remixes that like i could never accomplish but like great milk and underscores just make like edm-esque grooves and drums and those are things that i envy and really wish i could do but like a lot of them hit harder in like party settings i can imagine like the photophobia remix would turn our club upside down but yeah and then uh you mentioned you mentioned that you have like your your top 30 i won't ask you to go through all 30 but do you have like your top five just off the top of your head songs of all time yeah so yeah i do um, so number one is curtain curtain call by ruby haunt number two is nikes by frank ocean and for like since blonde came out for like three years nikes was like number one and then we started shooting videos for the acbh channel like pat and anthony and i like all those videos that mindless alex did at the end of every shoot we would play that song that song curtain call and it was already growing on me to be one of my favorite songs of all time and i had it slide up to number two at that time and then i think just having it be something that every time that we would finish like an eight hour shoot in a remote location we'd play that song we're like it's over and like the stress of like trying to get all these shots is over and now it's the end of the day it's just like eight friends like hanging out that became a very close memory to it and over time like i've just gotten like super attached to that song so that's one two is nikes by frank ocean it's getting a little tricky around <laughs> three i think i'm still gonna go for song for zula by phosphorescent that has the three through six has been like moving around a lot and then number four is a song from last year 
Hmm. Uh, Don't Be So Hard on Your Own Beauty by Yaoul. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. That yes. song is so good. I've been a fan of her for over a year now, I think, just because I found one of her music videos and they're always so, so, so The cool. music video for that song especially is like shocking. Yes, yeah. so unreal. The, the amount of effort that went into it. It's one of those things where I tend to find like an artist or something and then they'll have like crazy good music out. They'll like try to drop again and it might not live up to the expectations or like might not live up to the stuff they made a couple years ago. But I heard that song and I was like, oh my God, like this is like the greatest thing she's ever made. She's never really made songs just with like an acoustic guitar. Oh, it was so good. And then let me let me just take a peek at my list because like I there are a couple songs that used to be five and six over time have changed. Like one of them was In Camera by Yumi Zuma. Yam Yam by No Vacation. That's another one that sat around five and six. Chateau by Angus and Julia Stone has been in the top seven for like four years. Oh, no, it's okay. It's probably There's Your Man by Ben Howard. And then the last one I'd shout out is 1921 by uh, Leif Volebeck. Oh, and, and, okay, one more. And Asturias by OK Lou. There are very certain days in my life where something has happened to me or I felt a certain emotion and I played that song on repeat for the entire day straight. I remember f uh, freshman year of college in my dorm, I like printed out a list of my top 35 songs and hung it on the front door of the dorm just to make like make friends if anybody like saw the songs they like and i have a i have a whole playlist on spotify that's all my best songs all my favorite songs of all time on a similar note with all these different artists that you're like you clearly evidently like drawing inspiration from it's just if you could go back in time to when you first thought while you were still working on spark and you thought of maybe hey doing like a remix album and then just like if all limitations were removed and you could come up with anybody to work on it, whether it be friends or people that you've never worked with before to do remixes of songs, who would you pick? Someone that comes to mind right away is Field Medic. He's a huge inspiration of mine for all of my guitar songs. Um, I sent him Hibiscus before it came out because I was such a big fan of his and I was like, I need to do anything in my will to like become this guy's friend. And so there was a period a couple years ago where every other Tuesday he'd go on Instagram live and he would do rap battles. <laughs> and so he'd be drinking White Claws and then anybody that was watching the live, he could, could request and they would come in and the thing is they have to do a freestyle rap. There's like 120 to 150 people watching the live and like, I got all my friends to like be in it and I I was like I was requesting and they're all like add Ryan, add, yeah, Ryan. add Ryan. Yeah, yeah. So he adds me and I'm like freaking out. I'm not not like visibly but internally and he's like, Alright, what you gonna do? What you gonna do? So I was like I freestyled all over the oldie odd future beat <laughs> for like <laughs> A minute and a half. It was like, all right, I did all right. He's like, yo, that was sick. Like, uh, thanks for coming on. I was like, yo, I have like if I have like one thing and it's all I could ever ask for you. And he's like, yeah, what's up? I was like, if I send you an unreleased song, could you just listen to it? That's all I want. And he was like, all right, word. So then I, I DM'd him and I sent him a biscuit. And he really liked it. And then uh, I got to talk to him and I, and I think we might work on something in the future. And then uh, a while back on Twitter, you described the release of Spark as like kind of like an era, which I think is pretty apt considering like how all of your albums uh, from like uh, from Rocketeer up to Spark kind of have like individual like very specific themes. Uh, so I'm wondering like, how do you look back on like your earlier material from when you were just starting out or up to stuff as recent as like the original Spark? How do I want to say this? It A lot less pressure and a lot less thought uh, went into like Rocketeer and Platinum Green just because nobody really listened to my music. I would go and I would just work on stuff and without having anyone to compare it to and without having a ton of music friends, I would just be like, all right, let's just do this. And so like all my inspirations were like really, really big artists and they were just try to make good hit songs and call it a day. So a lot of my mindset was just like, I'm not worried about it being cool. I'm just worried about it being good, which is like an incredibly great mindset to have. I would just go in and be like, all right, I feel like doing this. I'm just gonna do this. It's whatever, whatever. And just try things out without any hesitation. I think after Platinum Green came out and it gained some traction, a part of me for like a year, it was difficult to like make things cause I knew that then people would hear them. And like, there was this whole like fear of like, you know, I have a song that's really popular. That's a certain like style of song. And I want to make every type of genre. Like if, even if you listen to Platinum Green, sure there are like a couple of songs that are really big on it, but the whole album has a extremely diverse, like eclectic genres throughout it. I don't want people to think, oh, he's like trying something new. Cause I'm not. 
Mm-hmm. I've always been switching up genres and stuff. That was just like a year period where like anytime I would start something, I'd get in my head about it. So it, it was really difficult to break that. The song Blue, Red, Yellow, Green, that song really helped because I remember I was talking to so many A&Rs and stuff because I was having a song do really well on TikTok. And once they find out that, they want to eat you alive. Like everybody wants to talk to you. And I remember showing blue, red, yellow, green to people like A and R's and stuff, and they were like, "Oh, this is not like this is not where you should go. Like you shouldn't be doing this." I'm like, "What do you mean? Like, have you ever heard of Hunger Hunter Gex? Like this shit's crazy." I was, yeah. You know, it's like it's like 2019, early 2020. Hunter Gex is like just on the come. Like they're doing crazy shit. Like I want to try shit like that. Like I want to do the <laughs> snare. Like I want to, <laughs> I want to, I want to do shit like that. I remember it, one A and R specifically being like, "It's okay, but just like way too much auto tune." Uh- Oh God, that's always the comment they make. I know, so I was like, uh, you know what, fuck it. Like, I trust myself. I think this song is good. I'm gonna put it out. And I put it out and it did pretty well for like, in comparison to a lot of my other songs. And I was like, fuck it. Like, I don't care if like, I'm not gonna be out here trying to make TikTok hits and get millions of plays. I I need to focus on what I wanna make. And like, that's the only way I can make things that are good. I do want to be more like world building. I do want to make more tags, like underscores. I do want to have like more of like a SoundCloud presence, which is like one of the main reasons I did the whole remix album on SoundCloud. Cause I want like the people in that community to fuck with me. Cause I know I've already, I got like some of the indie pop people back with like, you know, the, the platinum green area. And now I really want like the SoundCloud people to fuck with me. I think I'm just trying to make it not in like a douchey way cooler, but like cooler. Cause it's like, I add like more little things that like more people would notice. Like, mm-hmm. like people that like listen to like hyper pop and the SoundCloud scenes and stuff like that. Like if you add like a tiny little sound for one second of the song, like they'll notice that kind of thing where people that are like mainly in the indie pop scene, they're just like, oh, I really like the chorus. And there's nothing wrong with either of those two things. But I think that me personally, I've grown to where it's like, I'm like really like, oh my God, I can't believe Pat added that one little sound on that one part of the drum fill. I was like, that's so cool. And like that made the song for me. So like, I'm trying to do more of that. Like once I have a song finished, take a step back and be like, let's add some random little shit here and there and stuff that I can like help build a world for. I think you've definitely like accomplished that with like uh, stuff like the plus 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 version of Spark that you released exclusively on SoundCloud. I think that was like a really, really fun way of engaging that community. You mentioned uh, like my little blowing up on TikTok. Like I'm sure you've been asked a billion times what your reaction to that was. But what I'm curious about is what was like the weirdest or like craziest TikTok you saw with that use as the audio? Oh my God. Oh, I don't remember any of the specific ones, but I do remember because I didn't even have TikTok. It blew up and I, I didn't have the app. And like somebody like DM you like, hey, have you like checked TikTok or I know I it was a Friday night. It was around 830 or 9 p.m. We were going to go out to a party of uh, me and like Pat, Patchy Mate, Abbott, Gordon Snyder and a couple of our other friends were at my house. We're pre gaming. We're starting to drink. We're like, oh, tonight's going to be a fun night. And I just opened Instagram. And like, I had like, like, I don't know, like 700, 800 followers at the time. And it was like 30 new followers, which was like crazy. I was like, oh my God, what's going on? I would like tap the notifications button. And every time I refreshed, there was a new one. And I was like, okay, we need to figure out what the fuck is going on. Like ASAP. So like me and all my friends like buckled down and like, we realized that this one dude put the song on his story and like, and then I just remember for the next like week, like I, anytime I was bored, I would just sit and go through all the TikToks and like, you know, it's your first little taste of like people really fucking with your music. So I was like so excited about it. And I don't remember specifically any weird ones, but I remember when I found out that Charlie D'Amelio did a TikTok to it, I was like, oh my God, like that's crazy. I don't remember anything weird also because there were so many of them. Mm-hmm. So if there was anything like really weird, it probably got buried in like the thousands of videos for it. I feel like the Spark remix album is kind of like a full circle moment for you considering I understand like showing your music to others and it's more like raw state or hasn't like gone over like particularly well for you in the past, specifically in your senior year of high school. Can you tell us about what happened there? Oh my God. (laughs) Uh, I mean, yeah, well, that was just, that was just a long ass time ago. I mean, my, my music sucked. So like they're kind of, they're kind of valid for it, but I, yeah, I definitely got bullied heavy heavy in high school i I remember because there was this one kid and i'm not gonna say his name or anything but 
he made music and my girlfriend broke up with me and i was you know super sad a senior year of high school like depressed he was like yo try making music or whatever so i made music and i put out a song like one of my first songs i ever made I, it was horrible like you know it's like what do you expect like anybody makes their first song ever it's usually not very good especially if you don't have any like musical background like I, I didn't know how to play any instruments or anything like that and so the song sucked but like I got bullied like so heavy for it I don't want to talk about all like the specifics of like who, like how I got bullied but it was very public <laughs> like people weren't people did not hold back at all it'd be very public group settings of like group hum hum humiliation like it was horrible i remember like driving home crying one day after being like dissed by like a group of like 15 people i was like okay i have to either choose just to not do this or like or like i'm gonna get really fucking good at this and so that summer after high school i heard the kanye song i forget which one it is but it's off of like late registration i think and he's like three beats a day for two summers like, I deserve to do these numbers. So I was like, I'm going to make three songs every day this summer. And, like, while I worked at, like, a gas station, a Wawa, doing, like, eight-hour days, come home and, like, make three full songs every day. And, like, they obviously were pretty ass in the beginning but over the summer i just learned like new things how to use the program how to write songs just instinct and stuff like that and by the end of the summer when i went to college like i was writing like all right music i remember there were a couple people in high school that did stand up for me a couple of them were my friends like the girl there was a girl leah hoy and she did the cover art for uh rocketeer and platinum green uh, and she was a friend of mine i remember when that first song came out she was like, Ryan, I know that everybody, a lot of people don't like your song, but I liked your song. Like doing that for someone like is really, really, really important. And there was one other kid on the football team. I think his name was Ricky. And I just remember one time they came into our locker room because I ran track and they were playing my song and everyone was making fun of me. And this like 250 pound offensive lineman, six foot one or whatever, huge dude, Ricky, like a popular kid, like steps out and he's like, yo guys, I actually fuck with the song. And everybody was like, what? And I was, and like that kind of thing, like really, really, really goes a long way. And I think that if anyone in your high school is making music and it's shitty, and, and it's shitty, yeah, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's shitty, but it's there, but they're trying and it's good to support them and have them go for their dreams. It's unfortunate that that is kind of like as widespread as it is. I mean, like obviously with like the democratization of like more kids getting into music, you're going to get a lot more people like, trying it at a younger age and potentially like publicizing it and maybe getting made fun of. Um, so it's like, it's unfortunate that that has to be so, so widespread. So like, I'm wondering like as someone who unfortunately had to go through that yourself, like what would you like, what, advice would you give to somebody who's maybe like struggling to find support for their music anywhere other than like the internet? Cause I feel like hometown rejection is like kind of a common thing. If you're getting support from the internet, that's fire. And I think that even though 2017, when I started making music, it, wasn't that long ago in terms of like the landscape for like up and coming musicians is completely different. It, it is a lot easier to find communities online or like get your music to people that might like it. And maybe it was still like pretty easy to do in 2017, but I had no idea about it. Mm -hmm. So like if you're getting support online, like that's all you have to worry about is that you know that someone out there likes it and like your hometown doesn't have to like it and mm -hmm. your hometown probably won't like it. For the case of me, after I left my hometown a couple years later there are people from my hometown that were like oh my god ryan went to school here and like people would come from my hometown to my philadelphia shows and be like we're from coatesville like we all love you there and i'm like that's crazy everybody hated me there i think it's important to know when you are starting out that your music might not be good make that realization as long as you go into the attitude i'm gonna make it better is with, with any craft when you're starting out isn't gonna be good so like don't go out there and be like nah y'all are all wrong my song's great if you have like an online presence even if it's a couple people online that like your music just like use that and just focus on yourself making it better i think you mentioned community there and considering like the remix album has what like 25 features on it i think it's safe to say that that community is kind of at the heart of a lot of what you do uh like nowhere is that exemplified more with like anything could be here but um like you mentioned like you were actually a part of um of a different collective called requiem incorporated before this so i'm wondering like what would you say are some key differences between the two and like how you approach either of them well requiem inc was we all met online 
in a Discord server. I think it was like the hip hop Discord server, a Brockhampton Discord server or something. And they would do freestyle Fridays. And so they, everybody would go in and freestyle in the Discord VC. And I would go in and I remember meeting some of these guys and they were like, really cool and they made like cool music we all talked together online and stuff and the thing with that is that it's all online and we were also all trying to figure out who we were as musicians a lot of the stuff that we made and a lot of stuff that we put out was like exploration and like trying things out and not really sure how it was going to work out figuring out things i think with acbh now we're all very not sure of who we are as musicians or people, but we're a lot further along than where we were like three years ago. I have to choose my wording carefully for, for specific reasons that will soon make a lot more sense. It is really cool just working with a bunch of different people in real life and it's all people that I look up to and they're all very, very multi-talented. Like almost everyone that I'm friends with produces and does like vocals and everything. When in the old collective, I was like me and one other guy were the only people that did both. Mm -hmm. And so it's really cool now when you send like demos with other people that are in our friend group, you'll get not only like their vocals back, but all new production back and stuff like that too. Yeah. And then uh, you mentioned, you mentioned like being like multi-talented and everything. And like, uh, I'm not only, I feel like people like sort of looked at like, okay, it's Ryan, Patchy Made, and Abbott in an anything it could be here, but also it's mindless. It's also like a bunch of other really talented photographers. And uh, you've displayed quite a bit of charisma on camera throughout your guys' different music videos. And I feel like a lot of artists sometimes struggle to like, appear natural on camera or they just kind of freeze up or like don't know what to do with their hands. So I'm wondering like, what are some things that like you keep in mind going into each video shoot? I, I know people that have, I've talked to about this. I think the main thing is being comfortable with the people that you're at the shoot with. Like Alex and Nuge and Wyatt and Will, they're all like some of my best friends as well. And that's like our team that we shoot with those videos. I do know that if I go and shoot a video with someone else, I'll still be able to act the same way I do with them. But I don't know if before I started working with them, I would be able to do that. But I think the main thing is just getting comfortable with the people that you're shooting with so that you can physically do what you do when you like make the song for the first time and like you're in your bedroom and you're like oh my god this shit's awesome like i can't believe i just made this like being able to visually show that is just you acting natural without the thought of like okay the other people on this set are like viewing me the people that'll see this online are gonna view me it's always more noticeable when you're like uncomfortable or when you're like reserved or you're like trying to look cool or something versus when you're just like showing how excited you are about the song or exuding whatever emotion the song has in it just like fully without any hesitation. I think that's like a like a good tip is just to be comfortable with the people you're shooting because I feel like one of, one of the things I've always appreciated appreciated about your guys' music videos is how like it just I I can feel how much fun you guys had making the video like through the screen like the the whole like Halloween theme for like the the bang my head against the wall music video is just so much fun. Like I'm sure having like a group like anything could be anything could be here like uh, to, like draw from is like of, of course like helps with inspiration a ton but i understand like after the release of spark uh you made a tweet mentioning that it'd be the last album from you for a minute so i'm wondering like what do you do to keep yourself motivated when you maybe like run up against a creative wall or maybe like don't feel as motivated as you sometimes all, all other times do well after spark and then with the remix album recently i've been like i want to work with more people so a lot of people like people that are on the remix album and people that also aren't on the remix album like i reach out to them if i get stuck on things or like with my own solo stuff that I'm working on now, like working with someone that I haven't worked with before is like really fun. It really just helps get thing, getting things going when you can like produce with someone online. I do a lot of things where like I'll reach out to someone and then we'll both set aside like six hours and we'll start with a chord progression. We'll spend like 30 minutes producing with it, come back, trade stems and do it again and again, producing, adding vocals. And so that you can work on something for 30 minutes and then you're just like, I don't know what to do. You go back and a whole set of new oh i had drums oh i had this vocal harmony like stuff like that if i if i have like a demo and i like i'm stuck on it i'll just not touch it for like a month and i'll just let it sit i'll live my life i'll work on new things sometime i'll be like oh yeah let's hear how that sounds and like if if i'm stuck on it enough to where i'm like i want to work on it but i don't know what to do and i leave it alone for a month odds are it's a good enough song that where i'll hear it after a month i'll be like oh my god this is great Oh my god, I just I should just add this. Like or let me try like when you hear it again, hear it in a new light. And then uh with anything could be here, or at least a, a couple of you guys uh were set to perform in LA about a month ago, but unfortunately it had to get shut down because of COVID. Uh but I understand you've performed like quite a few times prior to that, correct? 
Yeah. All right, I'm just wondering, like, what would you say are like some of the lessons you learned from your biggest performances or like maybe misconceptions you had going in that like you like learned very quickly? I think the best, the best thing to do is just attack it. Obviously from my first show, scared shitless. Every show still, I get nervous, you know? But the best thing you can do is get out there and just send it because the people are there to hear music even if it's not yours if you're opening for someone and especially if you're someone like my size or smaller or even bigger like most of the venues we play are very intimate like none of us are playing huge things it's very intimate like so everyone there is gonna respond to how how much energy you give like you just got to get out there and attack it full on also live auto-tune is so fire <laughs> waves auto-tune real like real-time auto-tune shout out also like i have i have like instrumental versions of all my songs so like my vocals are like always live i'm never like singing over things and i don't know different people have different takes on it but i tend to like it when an artist isn't just singing over their track and it's cool because it also gives me like the freedom in the moment to like change lyrics or like change things if i mention a city in the song i can do that cheesy thing where you mention <laughs> the city that you're currently in you know yeah you're gonna be afraid and you'll get out there and the first song you'll be very nervous but by the end of the first song like you'll be very comfortable i think is is how it usually goes. I feel like a lot of times people make it out like, oh, once you get like big enough or perform enough shows, yada, 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 like you get over like the anxiety, but I don't feel like it ever goes away. Like I remember something interesting that like, like Eric DOA said is that he literally blacks out every time he performs. He just goes up, like blinks, and then he's off the stage. He doesn't remember any of it. It's like, because you get anxiety, but I think it is like, it's the right way to go of just like, people are there to hear music. So just give it your all. And you mentioned in the past that you often have some pretty wild dreams. So I'm wondering, have you ever had any like kind of particularly crazy ones in the, in the recently or no? Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean all all the time. Almost almost every night. Every night that I go to bed sober. If I'm not sober, I don't dream usually. I have like I have like two levels of dreams. I have I have like dreams that are extremely vivid and like I wake up and I was like I, and then I write them down and it's like a couple paragraphs worth of stuff. I can remember everything about it and like the very specific locations. And then there are other ones that'll happen like once a year that are like extremely extremely real like too real and they're very emotional and i wake up and like my whole day is like fucked because of it because it feels like i lived through like a lot of them have to do with like war or like the world ending or like people dying and i wake up and they're so so real and i have to like lay in bed for like hours just to get out and then like my whole day, whatever I was doing, I can't do it because I'm fixated on that dream. And I, I had one of those like a couple weekends ago when I was in New York and, and like no one died in that one. It was just, it was like, oh, it's it just so many layers to it. And I can vividly remember every room I was in, everything about every detail I was in. There are dreams that I had like years ago that I remember the landscapes of and like whenever I'm on a train, I'm like looking out the window, looking, waiting to see what I saw in the dream. And so they're all like, super vivid and the, after i have the ones that are like happen like once a year that are crazy vivid i have to stop writing them down and i have to like try really hard not to dream because like it's i have to take a break they need to like relax if you want to dream more which i highly recommend because i live like a whole separate life there and it's kind of fire just write down your dreams even if it's little it'll grow more and more and i'm at the stage now where it's just like crazy all the time it's really fun but can also be a lot and then i'm wondering like uh no matter how many artists you discover it seems like there's always going to be like a hundred more that you wish you found sooner so if you could pick a handful of artists to put our listeners onto right now who would you pick oh fuck <laughs> if you need to pull up like a playlist or anything go for it yeah yeah yeah. give me give me a second here I'm, I'm gonna try and think of people that like that are outside of like this scene everybody should listen to jace uh she's probably like the smallest artist that i work with but she's one of the best i, I listen to l e space l space l space e uh she makes really cool music that i think people that listen to like all the SoundCloud stuff and the remix album and stuff would really like. She doesn't follow me or anything, but I'm, I'm a big fan of her. All of her stuff is super cool. I've been listening to a lot of country music. I'm in my country music arc. I listen to a lot of Tyler Childers, Ian Munsick, Horses Are Faster, Great Milk, obviously, Christian Blair. Uh, yes, I don't know if yes, yes, yes. Oh my God. He's fire. Ale is fire. His song Rose Gold is crazy. If I if I could add a couple to that list, I would add the people that like Christian Blair often works with, uh, Car uh, Kaido and Starfall. They're both yeah. crazy, crazy talented. Yeah. Yep. I don't know. I listen to a shit ton of Drain Gang. If you're not a Blade <laughs> fan, you should become one. Oh, Dakota Dogma. That's one. Formerly colliding with Mars. Dakota Dogma. 
uh, that project has uh, some break ins f- features, like vocally and production wise, but they're secret. Riley the musician, Bixby, ND, Roan. And then uh, on a similar note, you've collaborated with quite a few people on Spark, uh, but I can imagine there's still plenty, many more that you want to work with. Uh, so if you could pick a handful of dream collaborators, uh, who would they be? It could be anybody like dead or alive. For a while, it was Black Winter Wells but I'm, I am working with her on some stuff. Ooh. So that has kind of been like checked off. It's weird, I don't think any of them are like, if the opportunity was there, yeah, I'd, fr- I'd, I'd love to collab with Frank Ocean. Like who wouldn't, you know? Or the 1975, who wouldn't? Bon Iver, of course. But like, I don't even know if I got that opportunity right now, I'd, sh- I'd shit myself. I don't know <laughs> if I'd be able to perform, you know? Kind of like just working with all my friends that I have now and people, cause I still have a lot of friends that weren't on the remix album or, like are just in the circle of people that I work with. And I'm sure there are probably so many other small artists that my friends are friends with that in the coming year I'll meet and be like, holy shit, their music is really good. I wanna work with Christian Blair on something. I really wanna work with Estrell as well. The big dream is to make enough money with the music that I make now so that I can then like rent out bands and make jazz music, like Frank Sinatra shit. And then also like full on country music. Like I need to get someone that can shred the fiddle, play the banjo. Once I'm like set, like financially, I'm going to be making uh, like full on country music and full on like Frank Sinatra shit. And so when I get to that time, if Frank Sinatra could come back from the dead, I'd work with him. (laughs) Fuck yeah. So we have Christian Blair and Frank Sinatra. I think that's a pretty good list. Yeah. Yeah. I'll get them on the track. I'll get them on the track together. Finally, you've come a really, really long way in 2021 alone. And I'm really, really excited for what the future holds for you, specifically that, you know, Frank Sinatra feature. Uh, So what are you looking to accomplish uh, with a whole year spread out in front of you in 2020 and 2022? Uh, I want to work on a farm. That's not music related, (laughs) but I'm looking into it. And hopefully in like March, I'll be working on a farm. I might move to like the middle of nowhere for a month, like Wisconsin or something. I kind of want to start like a side project, like be able to say like whatever I want on it. Cause as much as it's like, I'm detached from like my family and stuff like that. Like my music is still like my name. I kind of want to make something new as that has an artist name that isn't my name. And I can just like actually like in description in like descriptly talk about shit that's happened in my life that isn't very like PG. Yeah, and then I, I'm just working with a lot more people. And there's some stuff that I'm working on with a lot of people that once we're done with it, like it'll be very, very exciting. Very big stuff. Not to sound <laughs> Donald Trump esque, but it'll be very big. The biggest stuff, yeah. The biggest of stuff, yeah. Uh, and then I'm gonna move to New York and then I'll be like living in the same city as most of the people that I work with. And then that'll just be a whole nother wave of new shit no more uh, no more speeding tickets on the turnpike that's awesome okay. hopefully not yeah <laughs> fuck yeah okay um i think that's gonna wrap it up for us today thank, thank you so much for meeting up to me today <laughs> <laughs>